Rarely has a single competitive event come on so strong, captured so much attention, that it virtually redefines the sport it represents. In only its fourth year of existence, the World Extreme Skiing Championships have opened up a new frontier in the sport of alpine skiing. Call it what you wish, extreme skiing, backcountry skiing, or adventure skiing. It all boils down to the same thing, experiencing the beauty and the drama of the mountains firsthand by skiing its boundless natural terrain. Some choose to ski the gentler slopes and enjoy the winter environment around them, while others choose to take the mountains to their limit. These are the extreme skiers who compete in Valdez, Alaska. They're a special breed at the cutting edge of the sport who love skiing and love the mountains. Too much to limit themselves to running slalom gates or standing in lift lines at traditional ski resorts. Extreme skiing has its roots in 1960s France, when pioneers first began skiing peaks that until then had only been ascended by highly trained and highly equipped mountaineers. Not until extreme skiing became a competitive event in 1991 did the sport take hold amongst the skiing mainstream. Regional events are now being held around the world, to qualify the world's best skiers for the grand event in Valdez. From the cutting edge of skiing in the spectacular Chugach range of Valdez, Alaska, JSP presents the 1994 World Extreme Skiing Championships. The 1994 World Extreme Skiing Championships are brought to you by Nikon Sunglasses, changing the way you look. And by Sports Pep. Nutrition products for athletes. The ski terrain at Thompson Pass demands a special breed of athlete. He must not only be a strong, technically proficient skier, but a mountaineer as well. This is a mountaineering environment, and uh, extreme or steep terrain skiing, as people call it, is ski mountaineering. It's not skiing in a ski area. It's not like jumping off a cliff beside the chairlift at your favorite ski area. You have to use uh, mountaineering practices of route selection and, and be aware of the objective dangers of cornice fall, avalanches, rock fall, uh, cliff terrain hazards. Uh, and glacial hazards as well. The panel of seven judges rates each skier on a scale from one to ten. The highest and lowest scores are thrown out to eliminate any potential bias. Skiers are judged in five categories. Technique, fluidity, aggressiveness, difficulty of line, and control. Scores from runs on all three days are added up to determine the final results. Competitors who ski hard and fast are rewarded with high points for aggressiveness. And if the route they choose is technically demanding, involving tight chutes, extremely steep terrain, or difficult snow conditions, the skier receives high scores for difficulty of line. Jumping, also known as taking air, is not a separate judging category. 
but it often adds significantly to the difficulty of a line. The competitors must always ski within their limits. Severe penalties are imposed for losing control and for losing equipment such as skis and poles. Falling is considered the ultimate loss of control and can knock a competitor out of the competition. Air might not be a judging category, but that doesn't matter much to Dean Conway. The 30-year-old snowcat operator from Snow Valley, California, has a knack for seeking out what extreme skiers call sick lines, often leading him over 30 and 50 foot cliffs. Noelle Lyons of Boulder, Colorado, is back to defend her title as the 93 women's champ. Her background is as a World Cup ski racer. It's evident in her aggressive style, perfectly carved turns, and her love of speed. Not known for shyness, Noelle is a ski film star, landscape gardener, and a lead singer for a Colorado rock band called The Fornicators. Born and raised in Aspen, Colorado, Pete Bowers started skiing at the age of three. Unlike his brother Tom, a U.S. ski team veteran, Pete's style emphasizes jump turns over carved turns, an excellent technique for extremely steep slopes and difficult snow. This year's event attracted talent from all over the world, including Vela McDonald. Vela is the female winner of the European Championships in Chamonix, France. She's a former member of the Scottish national team, but she now lives in France, where she spends most of her time skiing in the backcountry. Jill Sickles Matlock is in her first year of extreme skiing competition. She took first place in the U.S. Extreme Skiing Championships at Crested Butte, Colorado earlier this year. But Alaska's Chugach Range are a far cry from the mountains in Jill's home state. She's originally from Maine. Kim Reichelm is another former racing standout, having competed on both the NCAA and pro circuits but she much prefers skiing her own lines to skiing through gates. Like many extreme skiers, coaches considered her too free-spirited for a highly structured life on the U.S. ski team. Instead, Kim teaches her own women's adventure skiing clinics at Crested Butte. 1994 brought the rise of 24-year-old David Swanwick. He took first place at the U.S. Extreme Skiing Championships in Crested Butte. Swanwick's aggressive approach is well-suited for adverse conditions. The going gets tough. Swanee gets it downright gnarly. Jens Hoffmann of Munich, Germany is partially responsible for the growth of extreme skiing competitions in Europe, also known as off-piste skiing, which in English means off the trail. This year, Jens helped organize the first annual European Off-Piste Championships in Chamonix, skiing well enough himself to qualify for Valdez. Shane McConkie, 24 years old, is both a pro mogul skier and a former member of the U.S. ski team. But like Reichelm, coaches consider McConkie somewhat unconventional. He's the only racer ever to compete in a sanctioned international event naked. With no chairlifts, how do skiers like Bruno Campagnier get to the top? Well, with binding adapters that allow them to ski uphill. Bruno, from France, is winner of the 94 European Off-Piste Championships. He's used to this kind of terrain. He's a backcountry ski guide in the French Alps. Rob Van Arnhem is a well-rounded mountaineer. He works as a Crested Butte ski patrolman by winter and rock climbing guide by summer. Van Arnhem takes pleasure in skiing routes that other competitors don't even think of. In the world of skiing, 1994 saw a major role reversal. While Easterners in the lower 48 states were locked in an Alaskan-style deep freeze, Alaskans were reveling in lower 48-style temperatures. But for the ski mountaineer, that can mean rockier slopes, narrower chutes, higher avalanche hazards and snow conditions that change by the hour. Here's what the skiers will face on Odyssey Mountain. 
A north-facing slope, 45 degrees in average pitch with a vertical drop of 1,600 feet. On day one of the competition, skiers have the option of skiing one of three areas. The North Ridge or Timid Route with opportunities for massive air into the main chute or main drain. Pitches above the 50 degrees. And there's the West Face or Prime Line laced with countless chutes and boulders. Right now we're uh, waiting for the judges to get in position. Approximately uh, two minutes, we're going to set our first four runner down, uh, and they can get a get a good look at them and see what the run's going to be like. The competitors have assembled on top of the mountain, and it's a few anxious moments before they make their run. The judges have out the binoculars and are spotting the competitors. They're ready for the competition to begin. Jack, you copy. Odyssey made a fine playground for the contingent from Squaw Valley. Dean Conway was second at the 94 U.S. Extremes, and last year's third place finisher here. He's a connoisseur of fine jump turns and also a huge air. Dean has also mastered an extreme skiing technique called the hip check or smear which is used upon landing to control speed. Conway's neighbor in Lake Tahoe, Pete Bowers, has a style remarkably similar to Dean's and combined it with an obvious go for broke attitude on day one. Bowers sliced the steep and deep prime line and avoided the gnarly trouble spots. His crisp airs, well-rounded turns, and aggressive style found great favor among the judges. At the end of day one, Bowers was tied for second place. <laughs> Bela McDonald from Edinburgh, Scotland also made herself known. McDonald exhibited the strength and consistency that won her the coveted women's European title. Her adventure on Odyssey Mountain was good enough for third place after day number one. Thirty-seven-year-old Jim Conway from Salt Lake City, Utah, is one of the oldest competitors in Valdez, but he didn't let on to his age. Conway is the consummate ski mountaineer. In 1992, he rappelled into the top of one of his routes. On day one in 1994, Conway also chose the prime line, the difficult line between the dangerous rock outcroppings. Jim and Dean Conway are very closely related, but only in their love of this sport. With 36.8 points, Jim Conway's in sixth place after day one. After several years as a judge, 1991 World Extreme Women's winner Kim Reichelm was determined to make a comeback in 1994. Following her male counterparts, Kim took the prime line down Odyssey, negotiating its tight chutes through the rocks. She was well on her way, finishing 14th overall, but first for the women. Dave Swanwick's mannerisms at the start are consistent with his aggressive style. The winner of the 1994 U.S. Extreme Ski Championships, Swanee hoped to be the first person to ever win both the national and world extreme titles. Like most of these extreme competitors, Swanee loves to ski in the backcountry. He prefers making precise turns to taking big air. And like all responsible ski mountaineers, always packs an avalanche beacon and a shovel in case of trouble. But there's no problem for Swanee on Odyssey as he skis to a tie for third with 40.4 points. 
All these competitors love skiing, but Dean Cummings of Telluride, Colorado, or is that Santa Fe, New Mexico, is the biggest junkie of them all. He does whatever it takes to access backcountry terrain and is often hiked to the top of the peak before the competitor's bus even arrives. Featured in many ski films, Dean is determined to win the world title after placing in the top 10 the past three years. See the cliffs below Cummings? That's called exposure. If Dean falls, he gets hurt, but he's more concerned about being aggressive, skiing a clean line. That's called self-confidence. Shane McConkie from Avon, Colorado, shows how a solid racing background can pay off when applied to extreme terrain, carving aggressive turns down the face of Odyssey. The steep pitch of the prime line poses little trouble for Shane as he powered his way down, taking a little air off the small cliff band. Conkey's grit and determination has been evident at several international ski competitions. And despite his transition from racing to the less regimented sport of extreme skiing, Jade finished out with a slalom turn through the finish. After day one, McConkie in the lead with 41 points, followed by Dean Conway and Pete Bowers, Swanwick and Cummings tied for third. Kim Reichelm regains her championship form to lead the women with 34 points. When we return, day two, 27 mile glacier. The warming trend at Thompson Pass intensified on day two and so did the competition. The challenge 27 mile glacier and imposing peak featuring an average pitch of 35 degrees over a 2600 vertical foot drop. The south facing slope and warm temperatures made for dangerous snow conditions. Officials roped off several areas. Still remaining, the timid route straight down the middle, the main drain to the east and the 55 degree plus prime line. John Biggers, you were here two years ago as a competitor. You're here now as a ski patrolman. What do you think of today's conditions? I just came down right now, and uh, the sun is really heating that up in there. It's like a cauldron. We've got wind down here, but in the main chute, in the cauliflower, <coughs> all it is, it's just an oven in there. It's really heating up. It's getting a little bit wet. So do you think it's going to turn from powder to kind of cement? It's sort of cement, but you know where it's really steep, it gives you a good edging. You know, you can power through that when you got the steepness behind you. With the snow deteriorating throughout the morning, it became imperative the competition start early to give the competitors the safest opportunity to complete two runs. The first competitor to lead the starting gate and challenge these severe conditions, Stefan Felder, a helicopter pilot, ski guide, and competitive skier from Switzerland. Flashing the main drain and cranking out a series of sweeping GS turns, Felder found the pitch to be more demanding than he was accustomed to, finishing day two in 28th place. Canadian Kelly Booth made her debut at the World Extreme Skiing Championships. Hailing from Whistler, British Columbia, she showed the technical strength that makes her the top pro racer at Whistler Blackcomb Ski Resort. She took on the challenge of main drain, using good giant slalom turns to maintain stability and balance through the steep section. A stellar effort by the Canadian earned her 87 points total for the two days of competition, good enough for sixth place. After a trying first day, New Zealand's Paula Hearn tried to redeem himself by descending the timid route down 27 mile. The grabby snow prevented Paul from his appointed mission, pre-releasing his binding. All is not lost for Paul, though. He hurried to put his ski back on and finished the day with a disappointing 53.6 points, giving him a two-day total of 74.2. The winner of the first U.S. Extreme Ski Championships, Dean Conway, is currently tied with Pete Bowers for second place. Conway chose a unique line between the timid route and the main drain as he elected to take air over a rock band, landing perfectly as he flashed down the steep Kalar. Launching a 20-footer in the middle of the course, Dean gains first-hand knowledge of how poor the snow conditions had become. 
The light powder snow of the early morning had turned to a nightmarish slope of cement. And by the top of the last pitch, Conway had become tired, allowing him to make a critical mental error, costing him to lose valuable control and fluidity points. He lost a ski pole, a capital offense in extreme skiing. As some local Alaskans looked on, Tahoe City's Pete Bowers took a creative route from the start, dropping him into the prime line. This emptied out into a rocky mound just above the judges stand called the Mons Pubis, an appropriate description coined earlier that morning by snow safety coordinator Chris Stetham. The dramatic line earned Pete a two-day score of 120.8 points in sole possession of third place. Sitting in third for the women after day one, Vela McDonald of Scotland kicks out of the start on her way to attacking the main drain. Slicing the thick cement like it was butter, Vela did not let snow conditions affect her run as she blazed ahead of the other women with a two-day score of 105.4 points. U.S. Extreme's winner and Crested Butte ski instructor Jill Sickles Matlock selected to ski conservatively down the main drain. Sickles Matlock utilized a different technique, double pole planting to initiate her turns. She relied on her racing background to carve strong turns down the 35 degree pitch. She scored well in fluidity and control and conquered 27 mile glacier, but only placed fifth after day two. As the day progressed, the conditions changed from a wet, heavy snow to a hard, crusty nightmare. We'll be back to see how these conditions affect the final competitors of day two. The scene at 27 Mile Glacier on the afternoon of April 3rd was more like spring break at Daytona Beach rather than the typical Alaskan April. Olympic gold medalist Tommy Moe caught a helicopter ride to the top for an afternoon of backcountry skiing, while some competitors elected to catch some rays. And unlike Daytona Beach goers, these sun worshippers like to earn their tan warm, and is. their turns. Jim Conway was one of the first to grapple with the increasingly challenging snow conditions. Jim is a connoisseur of backcountry skiing, spending five months a year touring the world in search of the prime line. Conway's method of operation is to keep the skis on the snow and work the steep line rather than catching big air and soaring over the obstacles. The technique kept Jim at the top 10 with a two-day total of 113.7. Meanwhile, at the top, women's leader Kim Reichelm prepares for her descent down the main drain of 27 Mile Glacier. Her experience in teaching extreme skiing at Crested Butte is a big asset here in Valdez. Choosing a similar line to Conway, Reichelm has a more difficult time negotiating through the steep rock section at the bottom. It caused Reichelm to lose valuable points and dropped her out of first and into third place. Having his game face on since early in the morning, Crested Butte's Dave Swanwick chose the most radical line on day two. The prime line was eaten up by this warrior as he turns easily on the 60 degree pitch with no room for maneuvering or mistakes. After negotiating his sick line, Dave sets up for a casual leap off a 30 foot rock floating like an eagle to a soft landing only to wait for the avalanche to pass before finishing his route down the mountain. Ketchum, Idaho's Kent Kreitler won the 1993 U.S. Extreme Championships. He's making his first appearance here at the Worlds. At Crested Butte, after a disappointing first day, Kreitler decided to forerun the final day of the U.S. Extremes, wearing nothing but a fanny pack and a smile. But on day two, Kreitler's smile comes from the sheer excitement of skiing lines that no one wants to take. Catching big air and landing on a small rock outcropping, Kent scores well with the judges and lands himself in fifth place with 115 points. Jens Hoffmann from Munich, Germany has dedicated his life to promoting the sport of extreme skiing. He helped organize the first European extreme skiing championships. Skiing the terrain smart, Jens opted to side slip into position before jumping off a cliff in control rather than risk a potential fall into the rocks. This tentative approach left Hoffman in 25th place with a score of 94.2.
Men's leader Shane McConkey was fired up for his run down 27 mile. After leaving the start, McConkey ripped a solid run down the main drain and over towards the cliff area to his left. But McConkey's aggressiveness backfired when he discovered the hard way how a few minutes of shade can quickly render a slushy landing bulletproof. This fall caused Shane to lose valuable control points, dropping him to fourth on day two. U.S. Olympic champion Tommy Moe looked on as Extreme Skiing's youngest contender, Seth Morrison, dropped in. From Gunnison, Colorado, Morrison, the second place finisher at the 93 U.S. Extreme Skiing Championships. After a disappointing ninth at the Worlds last year, Seth was determined to break into the top three by skiing an aggressive line down the steep chutes and into the tight rocks on the skier's left. Morrison's impressive skiing didn't help him earlier this season. The Crested Butte Ski Patrolman caught up with him during the first day of the season to confiscate his lift ticket. One of those ski patrolmen was Rob Van Arnhem. He claims he was only doing his job. Of course, Van Arnhem is known for losing his temper on powder days when others snake his favorite stash. After dropping into the main drain, Rob did a series of jump turns down the left side of the chute, only to find himself at the top of a craggy rock band. The rock band did not affect Van Arnhem's determination. He picked his way down the face, pausing at small rock outcroppings only long enough to see where the next slot was. The effort gave Rob a firm hold on ninth place. Veterans say the key to extreme competition is to ski at 98% any more and you'll make dangerous mistakes, any less and you're not going to win. At the end of day two, Dean Cummings has taken over the lead, the women's leader, Scotland's Vela McDonald. At the foot of the rugged Chugach mountain range, just 30 miles from the 94 World Extreme Skiing Championships, is spectacular Valdez, Alaska. Located at the head of a deep water fjord in Prince William Sound, Valdez is home to a large commercial salmon fleet, as well as the southern terminus of the Trans-Alaskan Oil Pipeline. Despite the disastrous oil spill in 1989, wildlife here continues to thrive. Sea otters, bald eagles, and waterfowl make their home in Valdez, as well as outdoor enthusiasts who take advantage of nature's finest splendors. But springtime is for backcountry skiing, and at the world-famous Extreme Skiing Championships, Competitor safety is first priority, especially this year, thanks to some unique weather patterns. Well, this year, even though we're above average in snowfall for the um, Valdez area, I think we're at about, we're over 700 inches right now for the year, and the average is around 500 inches, I believe. Uh, there was a, uh, an event that happened in February where it rained up to 5,000 feet even, and so that there's a layer down in the snowpack that's still there that's a, it's a hard, uh, surface down below the snowpack. So what we've been trying to do the last week is to find aspects that that hasn't been um, so prevalent. Behind the scenes at the 1994 World Extreme Ski Championships, a massive grassroots effort by Valdez citizens makes the event a reality. The mobilization is carried out with the aid of helicopters from Era Aviation, and there's lots of work done by the Alaska National Guard. With safety being of the utmost concern, that falls into the hands of some very capable personnel, including the Crested Butte Pro Ski Patrol, the Denali High Angle Team, and the National Ski Patrol. From start to finish, the helicopter landing pads, first aid stations, food service tents, and the spectating area, it couldn't happen without the help of numerous volunteers from Valdez, Anchorage, and the lower 48 states. From television grips to judges and the organizing personnel, hundreds of people have spent literally thousands of hours to make the 1994 World Extreme Ski Championships the best they can be. The motto, if you're not the leader, the view never changes. For the competitors, the event is very intense, but for the spectators, it can actually be quite relaxing. Okay, the lawn chair technology at the extremes, what are your thoughts? Better bring them. You're going to be out in the snow watching, you want to be comfortable, bring a good chair with you. What are the features you look for in a lawn chair? I like the low rider model so I can kick back very nicely. 
uh, feet are up in the comfortable position. Um, a little bit of reinforcement with webbing helps for them extreme sitting occasions. Another piece of important spectating equipment, a set of binoculars, or better yet, a high-powered telescope. This way you can catch all the action without having to get too close to the dangerous terrain. Day three of the World Extreme Skiing Championships found the skiers on the dangerous east side of Python Peak only after a short delay and a change of venue due to weather conditions. Volunteers and competitors had to be airlifted to the finish area for the final day of competition. Today is an alternative site. Uh, yesterday, Chris Detham from Canada and I did control work on uh, Diamond Peak, which is at 7,200 feet. Uh, that looked good for today's venue. However, the ceiling dropped. Uh, right now, clouds are down to about 6,000 feet, so diamond's out. So now we're going to see these uh, east aspects, east facing shoots of, uh, of python. We've uh, worked this in the last week. We've done extensive avalanche control, and uh, we think we're good to go from an avalanche stability standpoint. With the fear of avalanches being lessened, the competitors were allowed to ski any line they wished. What was facing them was a pitch of 55 degrees and a vertical drop of 1,000 feet. Many would ski the bed surface of the main avalanche path, which was very firm underneath, but with four inches of velvet-like powder on top. The strongest skiers would choose to pick their way down the main spine, taking various quantities of air, despite an extremely unmanageable wind-packed crust. The judges would be looking today to identify those competitors that, in the words of head judge Chris Leveroni, showed total dominance over the snow conditions and terrain. First up, Pat Campbell from Olympic Valley, California. Pat's used to the variable snow conditions. He hails from Squaw Valley, known for its heavy wet snow, Sierra cement. Campbell chose to take some air before working the avalanche slide path. Once there, he impressed the judges with some smooth, consistent turns. He finished with a three-day total of 125 points. Alaskan Kurt Clemenson was third at the Alaska Extreme Championships at Alaska Resort. Clemenson worked his way down the steep wall of the East Ridge of Python Peak. Clemenson went big at the bottom. Still, it was not good enough to move into the top 10. Alaskan native Calvin Mitchell of Juneau was sixth after two days of competition. He needed a dramatic finale. Mitchell chose a route similar to Clemenson, but lost fluidity on the steep face. Even with a strong jump at the bottom, 
Mitchell could not make up lost ground and finished the competition seventh. Another Alaskan favorite, Darren Mattingly, took first place at the Alyeska Extreme Competition. Darren is a unique individual who also competes in snowboarding. He finished second at the World Extreme Snowboarding Championships two years ago. But today would not necessarily be Darren's day. A bad landing on the lower cliff jump sent him sprawling out of control. Mattingly finished in 15th place. Bruno Campagnier grew up in Chamonix, France, the home of the founders of the extreme skiing movement. Campagnier shows the bomb-proof style that earned him first place in Chamonix in the European Extreme Championships. But once again, a bad landing spoils the run. And Bruno finishes with a score of 131.8 points, only good enough for 16th place. Colorado's Rob Van Arnhem is currently in ninth place. The ski patroller is known for his aggressive style and cool head in the face of grave danger. Rob chose a route that no one else would ski. line offered Van Arnhem opportunity to catch not one, but three airs. In the end, Van Arnhem moves up to sixth place. When we return, more of the action from Python Peak. We're on the north side of Python Peak, and with me is Brian cool. Peel, my Sherpa. Brian, how do you have us tied in here? Got a 50-foot rope with some snow anchors on one end and a large boulder tied off on the other. And it should hold us from either side, hold us on from either side of this ridge. And we're not going anywhere. Yeah, well, we've got a, uh, right around us, you'll see a lot of big clumps of snow here. Ski Patrol came in here two days ago and let off this massive slide. Looks about a billion tons of material came right off the top. One five-pound bomb did it, brought it all the way to the bottom, making for some really nice ski conditions. It was beautiful getting down here with our 80 pounds of gear, and we're going to have a great competition today. Take a look. Shane McConkie from Avon, Colorado, was looking to regain his form after taking a tumble down 27-mile glacier on day number two. Conkey chose the difficult route down the spine of Python Peak, which meant having to dice the heavy set crust with strong jump turns. A tiring task, even for one of the best free skiers in the world. McConkey's aggressiveness paid off, and a radical air at the bottom moved him up in the standings, but not enough. Female competitor Jill Sickles Matlock continued a strong display of her technical skills. She attacked the east wall on day number three. Overall, this Crested Butte ski instructor finished in fifth place. Back on top, 37-year-old Greg Morris from Anchorage, Alaska showed how scary it can be when a skier makes even the slightest mistake. Morris did regain his form in the lower section of the mountain, but finished out of the money in 17th place. Last year's female champion, Noel Lyons from Boulder, Colorado, chose the Primo Powder down in the avalanche slide path. The sometimes pro racer showed her turning prowess as she carved great giant fallen turns en route to a second place finish.
Trying to catch the leaders from third place is no easy task, even for Pete Bowers of Squaw Valley. Pete stayed true to his form with strong jump turns down the face, catching air when he could. But in the end, Bowers had to air it out in the true Squaw Valley tradition, and even that wasn't enough. For the 94 World Extreme Skiing Championships, Peter Bowers finishes third. Current women's leader, Vela McDonald, continued to show her dominance over the women's field. Her power and consistency were evident all through the contest, and Python Peak was no different. With a three-day total of 143.2 points, her style proved to be a top-winning combination in the judges' eyes. Former World Extreme Champion Kim Reichelm knew that she could not catch McDonald on her last run. She elected to go for a powder run rather than risk getting hurt with a more gnarly route. With one last run to let it all hang out, 1994 U.S. Extreme Skiing Champion Dave Swanwick did just that. Swanee showed all the elements needed to win. Powerful turns, aggressiveness, speed, and route selection. But what may have won it for Swanee was this fearless flying act on the bottom third of the mountain. With the win, Dave Swanwick becomes the first person to ever win both the national and world extreme skiing titles. After the competition, fellow extreme skier Scott Kennett caught up with a new world champion. Swanwick, you had a very fast, aggressive run with big air in the middle. How'd that feel to you? Um, felt really good. I really wanted to nail that run and just wanted to make really good turns and uh, show the judges that I could really turn because after yesterday, I had one run that was really fast and a lot of straight and uh, a lot of just flying out of stuff. And uh, today, I want to show them that I can really make solid turns. It's what, it's what I usually do. It's what I'm known for. And then uh, caught some big air and had fun with that and then uh, came through the bottom. Later that evening at the Sugarloaf Village Inn in downtown Valdez, the new world champions were crowned, Dave Swanwick and Bela McDonald. As we take one last look at Alaska's Chugach range, here are the final results from the 1994 World Extreme Skiing Championships. This year's championships brought to light that this is a world-class event. First, we saw Vela McDonald from the United Kingdom capture the gold and become the first non-American to place in the top three. And we saw the largest foreign men's contingent compete. In its short tenure, the World Extreme Skiing Championships has seen the sport evolve from one being a friendly competition of just the hot backcountry skiers to today, where the rewards are greater and many of the competitors train all season to prepare for this competition. And what do the competitors do on their day off? Ski, of course. Here are the winners of the 94 World Extreme Skiing Championships enjoying one last day in the land of the snow gods, Valdez, Alaska. As always, safety is a concern. This year, with a proper training and expert snow safety work, 35 competitors, judges, safety personnel, television crews, and volunteers took over 250 runs down pitches of up to 55 degrees without one single person receiving so much as a scratch. And a testament to the fact that this is a serious form of competition and the competitors and the supporters are serious that is here to stay. From high atop Thompson Pass, this has been JSP's production of the 1994 World Extreme Skiing Championships. The 94 championships have been brought to you by Nikon Sunglasses, changing the way you look.
by SportsBet, nutrition products for athletes. By Outside Magazine and their new Outside for Kids. And by Alyeska Resort, beautiful Girdwood, Alaska. Ski Alyeska. This has been a JSP International Video Production in association with Prime International.